All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I have another great guest today. Very excited to be speaking with Juliet Scher. Juliet received her PhD from University of Missouri in St. Louis, St. Louis. And currently, Juliet teaches at, uh, as, a, as a professor of English at St. Louis Community College. And uh, what got my attention and the reason for my invitation is to a large extent because Juliet describes herself as a qualitative researcher. And there is this distinction in academia, in social science, in many different disciplines, the distinction between quantitative research, quantitative methods, and qualitative methods. So I, I would love to ask you, Juliet, about this, uh, this distinction. How do you situate yourself? So first, let's begin with some background. How was your, how did you come to this field of quality? How did you come to call yourself a qualitative researcher? Well, I would say that that probably started uh, before I ever got to graduate school. I was and still am a heavy reader and writer. Um, so steeped in language, interested in people, interested in ideas, and not the most stellar high-level mathematician. So um, uh, st statisticians are, are amazing people to me. Um, but it was not an area that I wanted to um, you know, steep myself in um, and, and, and spend a lot of time on the statistics side of research. Um, so I was always interested in, in reading and writing, and that kind of led me to uh, qualitative research. My first uh, in introduction to qualitative research was at Purdue University, probably back in 1997, and uh, Dr. David O'Brien was my major professor there, and we would go over to the Lafayette side uh, West Lafayette is where Purdue campus is, and we would go to the Lafayette side um, and work with uh, sort of students who might have been labeled as reluctant readers. And so I got uh, my feet wet with collecting uh, qualitative data and helping Dr. O'Brien analyze it and learning from his analysis. Um, then in 1999 at Purdue University, I uh, conducted a master's thesis or a study for my master's thesis. Um, Dr. O'Brien was on that committee, um, but also I had um, Dr. Dale Schunk, who is arguably, uh, if you're familiar with him, the godfather of American educational psychology to some degree. Um, heavily, I would say. Uh, he was on my committee as well. Um, and I worked in the athletic department half time. Um, I was a former student athlete. And when I went to Purdue, I was lucky enough um, to get a position in the athletic department in academic support services. Um, and uh, towards, I guess it would have been my second year there, I was able to convince the athletic department um, to convince them to allow me to create an academic uh, recognition board. And along with that, something that was called the President's Cup. Um, to this day, those boards still exist and the president of the university still hands out to like the team with the highest GPA. I don't know if it's every semester or if it's annually at this point, but, um, you know, hands out those academic rewards to motivate students, you know, student athletes to attend to both their athletics and their academics. Um, however, um, we didn't want to just institute those rewards. I was interested in learning what the student athletes perceptions were. Um, and so I conducted a survey um, and, uh, you know, was able to ascertain, uh, you know, data related to like their achievement motivation. Um, the big one was locus of control. Were they internally or externally motivated? Because that related, of course, to these external reward systems. Um, uh, let's see what else, uh, their self-concept, um, their academic achievement, um, you know, those kinds of uh, things that statistically um, we couldn't have gotten at, you know, with, with, with mathematical analysis. So mm -hmm. um, I was really interested in uh, hearing what they thought about it. And in fact, we made some adjustments to the boards based on um, feedback, you know, that, that made them um, you know, more appreciated by the student athletes, I think, and they, they still exist today. So that was sort of my first foray into qualitative research. Um, and, and I've been, I, I've conducted a lot of sort of informal um, qualitative studies um, at my institution um, over the years. Um, statistics, again, have always, you know, what, descriptive statistics in particular have always kind of been at the, at the um, at the advent of a lot of those qualitative studies. So, you know, you take a look at the data, right? And you say, what is, you know, what are the data telling us? 
And you can, you can see, for example, you know, one area of study um, that we did say back in about 2006 here at my institution was taking a look at the success rates of students who were testing into the lowest reading levels. Um, and this was this was a, a problem and, and still to this day kind of is in higher education, like the, the, the problem or the challenge is how do we increase student success, right? And that's an area that I'm, you know, interested in, obviously, as a faculty member. And we could see in our lowest level reading cl um, classes, very uh, bimodal distribution of success. You know, we had A's and B's and we had like D's and F's. And there really wasn't too much sort of in between. So if you were in those courses and you were doing well, you know, you were doing well. And if you weren't, you were not. And so we were interested in, in terms of student success and how do we reach that group of students who is not, you know, uh, is not moving on from those lower courses. So if they don't move on from those courses, they're never going to earn a college degree. We have to, you know, scale them up. And quantitatively, you know, the, the knee-jerk reaction across the nation was just, you know, well, you've got to increase tutoring and you've got to increase advising and help them understand they can't, students can't work 40 hours a week and take 18 hours and all these kinds of things. And um, one outlier group that turned out to be significant were students nationwide that were accessing open access community colleges um, and these were students with intellectual disabilities. So they may not have attempted um, a, a high school curriculum that, that was unmodified. And so they would have, a lot of these students had a modified high school curriculum, and then they were enrolling at open access community colleges because they could. Um, and they, we found out through the qualitative study that they, their parents, advisors, faculty, everybody kind of agreed that these students were not enrolling for the purpose of earning a college degree. Mm -hmm. So more tutoring, more advising, all these intensive and expensive, you know, interventions, <laughs> they weren't touching the real issue, um, which is that their enrollment goals did not match up with the goals of all the interventions, you know, of the college. Uh, and again, right. this, is, this is nationwide data. Um, so about that time, um, I was in the PhD program at University of Missouri, St. Louis, um, and I read a book by my major advisor, or I should say uh, my major professor, Kent Farnsworth. He wrote Leadership as Service. And um, I just wanted to read just a little bit out of chapter six, mm -hmm. um, which is entitled Hearing Every Voice. And that was one of my favorite chapters because you know, it speaks to my you know, interest as a qualitative researcher. Mm -hmm. And he was talking here about leadership meaning quote, to help each person served by the organization realize personal goals of growth and service, while at the same time furthering the mission of the institution in an atmosphere of power with, and the leader's first responsibility must be to learn what those goals are. Um, so, you know, that certainly spoke to a need to ask questions mm -hmm. and to not make assumptions about student enrollment and to not read mathematical or statistical data alone and you know let that drive your next move which is too often you know i think what people do because it's it's a little bit easier sometimes to collect you know statistical data and run those analyses um, and then make assumptions mm -hmm. about what the data are saying um, and it's it's you know so so i always kind of like to use you know qual uh, quantitative data to you know spur qualitative questions Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think what you are referring to is, in general terms, the kind of sensibility that uh, being a quality researcher requires. Uh, sens sensibility in recognizing how loaded these questions that we ask are already. Like, for example, if, uh, if, if somebody asks me, how happy are you from zero to 10? And there's already so much assumption loaded into that kind of question. Or if I, if I ask you, are you an introvert or an extrovert? And you only have these two options. I'm not asking what would you mean with this term introversion? What does it mean to you? So that gives us a shortcut, a quick way of exchanging information. But a lot of the assumptions are uh, are left unexamined. Would you agree with that? That 
couldn't agree more. Um, so a book that kind of came out of that, I, we, I had a 2010 dissertation that won a national award. And from that came this book called Community Colleges and the Access Effect. Mm -hmm. And I, I co-authored this with Dr. Mir Anson, who still works in student success at University of Iowa. And our largest chapter there is um, post-secondary education alternatives. <laughs> so, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, 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 no, one was, no one was talking about what do we do besides get students to graduate college? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and we joined the conversation and said, not everybody here, you know, is aiming for a college degree. Yeah. And in addition to that, we have some students that might be thinking that they're, that, you know, that they want a college degree, maybe parent parental expectations, certainly societal expectations, you know, the value of a college degree. So they're here at an open access community college, and they might be thinking that they're, you know, degree bound, but that might not be ultimately what they um, achieve, what they're interested in. Um, and, and so, you know, post-secondary education alternatives is, um, you know, it's a counter argument to the idea that we need to just figure out how to graduate more students. They were asking kind of the wrong question from the statistical data. Mm -hmm. um, they were asking, how do we just make that number bigger? And we were like, well, sure, you know, that that number is important, but also that's not the only, you know, goal here with student success. We need to broaden our horizons. And we wouldn't know that if we did not interview students and ask them and ask their parents and ask the advisors and the faculty who have those experiences. Um, and it, today, that is still a book that is used in graduate programs around the country um, to train educational, um, you know, leadership. Mm -hmm. Great, great. And uh, it's an invitation. It seems like it's an invitation to do more work, and but it's more meaningful work. It's it's harder. It takes more time. It takes more effort to to understand somebody else's voice and their, their way of perceiving. Um, so it, it, it's yeah. a heavy lift for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of data cleaning and in, in data collection with statistical analyses as well. So I don't mean to minimize the work there sure. mm -hmm. by any means, but it, yeah. it uh, um, not everybody wants to do qualitative because it is, it is labor intensive for sure. Right. But if you find questions and people, you know, that you're interested in, which again, um, you know, goes right back to Dr. Farnsworth's book, Leadership is Service. Um, that's why I wanted to, you know, to talk a little bit about that book, because mm -hmm. it is that sort of a servant's heart, you know, and an interest in uh, serving a, a greater good. Um, again, you know, when it came to the question of the students who were, you know, with intellectual disabilities who were enrolling in the community college, nobody was really trying to figure out, nobody knew they existed, that was really in power above the classroom level. Um, but nobody was trying to figure out where are these people in our society and, you know, how do we help them, right? Mm -hmm. How do we help their parents? Um, and that's where those questions were born out of. We could have asked a lot of other questions and studied a lot of other student groups in that, you know, group, but that was a group that to me was really needed to be highlighted. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm glad that we did that because there have been a lot of programs that have been created for those students mm -hmm. and conversations that have had, you know, have, have been had that would not have although otherwise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so let's talk a little bit, uh, if you don't mind about qualitative research and how you, you would situate yourself, describe your engagement with research. Uh, what I'm talking about is uh, like there are some qualitative approaches to research that other people are doing and you you differentiate yourself from them for example ethnography uh, some people do interviews some people have sociological questions when they do qualitative research uh, how how would you describe your particular engagement and how it is informed you would say with other uh, other things that you other life experiences other things that you you learned in academia or outside of academia Sure. Well, I, I teach at a community college and I have for 23 years. Um, so a research agenda is not, um, a formal research agenda is, is not, say, a big part of my required, it's not any part of my required workload. Mm -hmm. um, so I have engaged in formal ways um, along the way, um, you know, as, as I could, but I would say currently, um, you know, I am involved in a lot of uh, classroom level action research more than anything. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, you know, constantly uh, gathering survey data from my students um, and uh, all the way into, you know, individual interviews. Um, I've, I've been at this for 23, 23 years now, so I have a, a, a history, right, of, um, you know, 
interviews, let's say in qualitative data that I've gathered from students that I can balance against individual interviews, you know, um, in the immediate. So I will talk to students, um, you know, in, in classrooms or um, by text or email or whatever it takes to, to kind of get the knowledge that I need to help understand, are they an outlier or do they fit into one of these categories of students, let's say that I've had, you know, for, tw for 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, and I find that if you don't take, if you don't collect that qualitative data, you don't know and you can make assumptions about why, for example, just this past week, um, I had a student who, you know, walked in late and there had been, you know, uh, instances of that, right? And finally, I said, hey, you know, hang out after class, let's talk about this. Um, and I, you know, I do that frequently where I will figure out that, you know, early in the semester, if it's, a, if it's an early in the semester kind of thing, it's usually that the student um, has not learned that you need to actually set an, a, a drop dead alarm to like leave your house mm -hmm. or, they've, or they've simply set it too late. So like they might know how to set a recurring alarm to go out, you know, on Friday night by 10 p.m. They're like, hey, it's time to go, right? Mm -hmm. But they might not have been motivated to figure out that you actually need to do that and it's important to be in class before the professor even arrives. Yeah. And so, you know, I don't know what the reasoning is, right? Mm -hmm. Unless I ask them. And so sometimes it will come down to that where I'll, I'll just kind of bluntly say, well, do you, do you set an alarm, you know, to leave your house? And they'll admit that. And I just pull my phone out and I go, look at this. I go, I've ever been late to class. No, you know, I said, well, I said, I get pretty busy, you know, I, I'm reading and I'm grading and I need to be focused on that. I so, so I have alarms mm -hmm. in my phone, you know, and so we were able to have a very productive student success conversation because I took the time to ask mm -hmm. and I kind of know what to ask over 23 years now, right? I've seen this a million times, but at the same time, students will sur surprise you, mm -hmm. um, you know, partway through one semester, uh, students started kind of showing up late and it turned out, um, you know, it was like a, a, an automobile issue or whatever, couldn't get a ride. Um, and we figured out, I know on a couple of different occasions, we had, we had figured it out so we could get the student rides. And then on, on one occasion, at least, I know that I just straight up picked the student up. I said, where do you live? Because I was trying to arrange rides, figure out how do we get them here. And the person said, well, I live here. I said, well, that's right by me. I said, I got to be at school every day, you know, at this time you do too. So I'm going to come by and pick you up, you know, and you don't know those things if you don't dig in and, and get, you know, get that kind of uh, qualitative feedback. So, yeah, um, yeah. yeah, that's a very community oriented way of thinking. It doesn't occur to most people uh, to think outside the box box in those ways to, I can pick somebody up on the way. And there was one more thing I thought about as I was listen listening to you. I uh, taught for about five years in Asia at the University oh. of Macau. And uh, I, I had this experience of a few students who would just always uh, come in the middle of uh, a class, come in the, mm -hmm. in the middle of the lecture. And it would just, for them, it would be something to just, a lecture was something to drop drop in. Like it's, it's totally fine to come right. in halfway. It's like a concert. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, <laughs> culturally or maybe it was a personal assumption was like sure. their, their personal stance in mm -hmm. that culture and uh it would for it would be very surprising for them for me to notice to take note of them and pause the lecture and just say oh you're late and just take note no, taking note of it and uh, letting them know that their presence and their arrival time matters it is important right. when they show up and that the fact that they show up is is important and that would sure. impact that in, next time they would uh, be more likely to be on time Right. Yeah. So, and I mean, in, in, in my case, like I said, you know, you, you, you don't know always the reasons why, especially if something changes all of a sudden, you know, a student starts coming the way, you know, ask, right. Interview, um, yeah. you know, find out, um, yeah. get some, get some, get some qualitative data yeah. you know, yeah. so that you can, so that you can, you know, help them correct. Um, yeah. Especially again, where I teach, um, we have a lot of students that might be their first semester ever in college and mm -hmm. um, they, they need some help, but they don't know how to ask for it. And they are not self-advising so well. So they, you know, they, it's good to, to find out from their perspective, what they're thinking so that mm -hmm. you can help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if, for people who are curious about getting into research so do you sometimes have students who ask you about your research and they, they might be interested in getting into it and do doing like getting hands-on experience 
Um, That's a great question. Um, I, I, again, I, I teach 100 and 200 level courses. Um, and so we don't do a ton of undergraduate, like pure research. Mm -hmm. um, we have our students are oftentimes working quite a bit. Um, sure. and, and so they're not like out in the field, like I had the luxury of doing when I was at Purdue with Dr. O'Brien. Um, so they, they do have, I would say in my writing classes, opportunities to go research. Um, it depends on what kind of topic they might choose. Right now they're doing like a, um, a choose your next adventure. Mm -hmm. And so that's very broadly interpreted. And I have students um, doing all kinds of, you know, they're, they're making all sorts of plans. And it has the, you know, the, uh, they have the opportunity to write more of an informative essay. So to go mm -hmm. gather research, um, whether it's maybe the next college that they might transfer to, um, or they're, they're not sure, maybe they're not sure they might be between two different colleges. And so they have to go gather that information and compare and contrast. And they might be trying to write a little bit more of a persuasive essay um, mm -hmm. where they have to go gather, you know, the right the right kinds of evidence so that they can, you know, convince um, one of my students um, said that she and like four or five of her friends were going to go to Hawaii. And we listened to her talk about her plan the other day. So we were like, well, is, is this informative only? Or is this like a persuasive essay? Do you have anybody to convince? And she admitted mm -hmm. that she had to convince like her mother to let her at 18 take a Hawaiian vacation with four or five friends. And we kind of came to the conclusion that it is possible that she might need to make those plans and she might not be successful with the persuasive piece. But we did talk about what kinds of evidence might help her make her case. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, to, like what kinds of concerns do you think mom has? And of course, mm -hmm. everybody in the class is kind of helping and chiming in and, you know, well, safety and uh, finances were the top two <laughs> impediments, maybe. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Understandably. Sure. sure. So yeah, I wish I had an opportunity to kind of work a little bit more with like, um, traditional, you know, data gathering and, and that sort of thing. But um, I, with my 100 and 200 level students, we don't get too, too mm -hmm. far into that. Mm -hmm. How about, uh, do, you, do you ever discuss uh, with students uh, writing diaries or journals, personal journals? Do you see like uh, value in that? Or, or do, would you encourage that uh, in your I students? Think there's, yeah, I mean, as it relates to qualitative or just in just general? A personal like value, like, like as a personal practice. I think it's, yeah, I think everybody's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, people process, you know, information uh, mm -hmm. differently and process emotions differently. But I, I do feel strongly that there's high value um, in keeping a personal journal, you know, whether it's uh, goal, you know, goal setting or are more, you know, oriented towards, you know, just evaluating your own emotions. Um, mm -hmm. I, I've had a son, I have a, I have two sons, but, um, mm -hmm. and a daughter, but my 16 year old son um, is abroad quite a bit. He, he wrestles um, internationally a lot and is out from underneath our roof quite a lot. And so he's dealt with, you know, a lot over the last two or three years mm -hmm. of this kind of intensive training. And, and he said to me how helpful keeping a journal has been for him so that he's not like, you know, he's not lonely. He's able to process his emotions and thoughts and kind of keep himself focused. So yeah, I think there's a lot of, a lot of benefit there for sure. Okay, great, great. Uh, and you know, later on, it could be uh, for him, he could return to them as data and write, turn them into something else, who knows? That's, that's completely true. Um, I don't know that this is the kind of segue to this because I, I, we might get to that towards the end when you were asking mm -hmm. me about like what it is that I'm doing, but sure. um, my latest work is, is writing books. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I actually mentioned that to my son when he told me that he was keeping a journal. Um, and I said, well, I said, I think that would make a pretty good book someday if you wanted to, you know, fill that in and expand on that. So yeah, everything's Absolutely. qualitative, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Everything, at least initially, at least sure. initially. Yeah. Um, before we get to the, the current, uh, your current work, I want to touch on possible misunderstandings of qualitative research and why it might be important to clear them up, to clarify the misunderstandings. Okay. Um, so in other words, what might be like a, a common misconception about qualitative sure. research? Yeah. Yeah. One would be that, it, that I, and I just thought of this, but the idea that it's like easier, you know, I kind of mentioned earlier that I'm not, you know, I can balance my checkbook, um, you know, I, I, I'm okay with math, but I'm, but I'm not, it's not my personal strength and partly because it's not my, my personal interest. Um, but, but qualitative 
uh, research is not easier. It's mm -hmm. just as rigorous. Um, it's just as diverse in terms mm -hmm. of tools um, that you might use and the need to select the right tool, you know, for the right situation. Um, it is, as we mentioned, very time consuming um, if you do it right. Um, so I, I, that would be one misconception I would say probably would be helpful mm -hmm. to identify and, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and address. Uh, maybe another would be like the idea that your findings out of qualitative work are not static. So the, you know, the, the, the misconception that if you have interviewed a group of people and you found, you know, X, Y, Z, well, that's, that's it. That's true then for any other group that is like that group. Sure. And that's, of course, you know, not true. You might interview the same kind of a group, right, in the same circumstances, and you might, um, you know, impress uh, many of the same findings, but you'll inevitably tease out some additional threads that are really, really valuable. Um, and, and in that sense, you're adding you know, to the work that you've already constructed. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you'll you'll find things that really kind of challenge your initial um, findings, and and some of that is because of the work that is linear in time. Um, you know, things change over time. So yeah. you might interview a group of students. Uh, you know, like I, for example, I mean, the solution that I offered to the student about repeating alarms or putting alarms at the right intervals, right, in their phone to get them out of their house on time so they could come to class on time. That's not a solution I would have offered 20 years ago because people didn't have cell phones, mm -hmm. you know, or they didn't have them in the numbers that they do now with the features that we have. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, qualitative um, findings are uh, living, breathing findings. You know, um, mm -hmm. so they're 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 meant to be built upon and 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 meant to evolve. You know, mm -hmm. over time, and hopefully you build on that and you adjust your findings. You know, when it when it calls for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like organisms that go into the world and they might change, they might grow, be transformed, and enter into relationship with different things. Uh, okay, so uh, please tell us a little bit about what you're currently working on, and a little bit about the the future of your path as a researcher? Sure. You're, well, you're writing, yeah. Go for ahead. now, anyway, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to continue in my position here um, at St. Louis Community College in the English department. Um, so I don't, again, outside of my own classroom action research, I don't engage regularly in qualitative, qualitative research here at my institution as needed. Um, and, but I found a way to scratch that itch. Um, and in 2016, uh, I mentioned my son wrestles, well, my daughter wrestles as well. Um, and so we've, I've spent a lot of time in a wrestling room and around wrestling coaches and practices. And as a qualitative researcher, I just want to encourage anybody who might be listening to this, like you can, you can conduct qualitative research anywhere, yeah. right? So rather than sitting there and uh, just, you know, reading a book or, you know, I, a lot of times I was grading papers, but I also had plenty of opportunity to listen to um, their coaches and in particular, their private coach, Nick Perler, um, who owns the largest wrestling school in America. Um, my kids are lucky enough to go to Perler Wrestling Academy. And I have sat in so many, you know, wrestling rooms and listened to him philosophize about everything from, um, you know, um, internal motivation um, to match readiness, uh, lots of, lots of um, you know, sports psychology. And I approached him, I've known Nick for a long time, probably going back to the mid eighties when he was a wrestler and at the same time my brothers were. And I finally approached him one night after practice and I said, Nick, I said, and, you know, between your emails and the talks that you give the, your athletes at the end of practice, I'm like, this is really good stuff. You should, you should think about putting this in a book because, because this is his business. This isn't like a part-time thing that he just does. This is like what he does. I said, you should really consider writing that down so that it doesn't continue to get like lost in space and lost in, you know, emails and that sort of thing. And he said, you're hired. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I said, well, where do we start? And he said, I'll tell you what, Juliet, he said, I've got these two CDs. That tells you how old this is, right? Um, but he says, I've got two CDs, he says, because he's a real smart guy. Mm -hmm. And he said, I, uh, I've, I, I was recording these voice, you know, um, recordings on these different topics. 
And so we had the CD like labeled, you know, mm -hmm. all these different little subtopics. And the first thing I did, because, you know, was I started listening to it and then I thought, okay, wait a minute. Some of this stuff is maybe a little bit like repetitive, you know, um, like in, you know, he's busy, right? He, he's, he's a wrestling coach. He's not organizing like a paper, right? Mm -hmm. And writing, he's just like, picking up a microphone and saying some stuff into it that comes to his mind that is going to be good for his wrestlers. And the, 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 the wrestlers love those CDs, but I said, we can do this in a more organized, you know, fashion. So the first thing I did was transcribed it all. I transcribed it all. It was hours of spoken word. And then I started thematically anal analyzing it mm -hmm. and looking for, you know, patterns. Some of them are of course really obvious, right. And jumped out, but other things were things that he might have, in my opinion, like mislabeled. That was like, ah, oh, that's that's a different category. He's labeled it this, but it's really, you know, it's really something a little bit different than this other thing over here. And so I, that was, you know, that was the start of that. And that, and from that came um, all of these, you know, little subtopics in these chapters. Like he's got managing nerves, remaining positive, practice being tough. Um, the importance of staying power, motivation, mm -hmm. all these little, you know, categories within every chapter came from his spoken word. And then from that, um, it was an Olympic year. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the Olympics were being held down in, uh, in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro. And um, we were, I was able to uh, watch the Olympic wrestling and pull in really timely anecdotes from USA wrestling in particular, USA wrestlers and their successes and, and their challenges, right? And pull in those timely anecdotes. And that was 2016 um, when the Perler Way was written. And so there's anecdotes in there. Um, there's also research, um, uh, you know, quite a bit of research that I did. He would, Nick would tell me stories. I would ask him, you know, to explain something or, um, you know, can you give me an example of that? And then I, he would send me down another rabbit trail to go, um, you know, do a little bit more research, but um, it, it's a great book. And then we, we wrote that in 2016. Mm -hmm. And then um, in 2020, we came up with uh, Wrestling is Life, which is a less intensive, um, I mean, if you were to look at the bibliography of, and, you know, and all the resources in the Perler way, it's, it's written more at a high school, college level. Mm -hmm. um, but wrestling is life is written for, um, you know, elementary kids. Okay. Um, so that was a 2020, um, publication and that was nonfiction. And then since then totally unrelated really to qualitative research, I would suppose, um, are these three fiction books that, um, uh, were also written. So this one is, um, the wrestler who didn't know she was a wrestler, um, mm -hmm. kind of made sure that that first book that we wrote, um, because women's wrestling is growing, um, in, uh, in the world but certainly uh, here in America, I wanted to make sure that our first book was one that supported um, girls and women in wrestling. Um, the second one is the wrestlers who learned about peppered moths. Um, I always do a pretty good job of sneaking in some uh, academic lessons, trying to build background knowledge. So um, this is kind of about the, uh, the famous um, black and white peppered moths, um, natural selection that occurred around the industrial revolution and uh, Britain. So those, those wrestlers get to learn about that and about friendship. Um, and then this one is uh, the wrestler who learned to shoot again on Sundays. And that's a little bit more of, um, I would say the closest thing to a pure wrestling book in terms of like wrestling psychology and, you know, being aggressive and uh, looking to score on the mat and um, not being timid and things like that. So, so, wow. so that all started with the Perler way, but, you know, just kind of keeps evolving and in things yeah. that I'm interested in and in ways that I think as an educator and a parent, how can I help, you know, wrestlers in a very challenging sport, mm -hmm. both physically and emotionally, how can I help more come to the sport and stay and thrive? And mm -hmm. how can I help Nick's business for what he does for my kids and so many other kids? How can I help get his message out, you know, to more listeners? So, yeah. and that all started with a qualitative analysis of, his spoken word and yeah. then doing a formal thematic analysis right right because uh, it seems to me just like how your uh, perspective opened up his world of wrestling you saw it through your uh, quality researcher lens and you kind of saw the potential in, in its being expressed he also seems like he also sees the world and wrestling itself could be a model for many other things we say like i was wrestling with this wrestling with this question 
you know, I was, I was wrestling with this philosophical issue or, or question, yeah. topic. Well, yeah, I would say, I mean, that's the title of this book is Wrestling is Life. Um, and, and that's chosen, you know, for that purpose to just indicate that, um, it, you know, it is, a, is it, it is a metaphor for life. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that's why, you know, uh, you know, recently I'm trying to think where, I think it was an online forum and someone was asking about, you know, how to make your wrestler, I think, more successful. And I think my answer got a lot of interaction, positive interaction. And the idea was like, you know, you can measure success in the sport of wrestling in a lot of different ways. And people have different tools. They have different access to levels of coaching. They have different resources like money and time and parents. And, you know, there's obviously a direct correlation between all those things and success in this sport. So, um, you know, does it mean though, that if you're not standing on the top of an Olympic podium at the end of your career, that you should not have wrestled or that, you know, you were not a good wrestler. And the answer to that, of course, is no wrestling is life. You know, and there are challenges inherent in that sport that, you know, cause parents like me to want to enroll their children in that and support them on whatever their journey might be, as long as, you know, they're working hard um, and trying to get better every day, because I don't know how to put it any better, but that's sort of the, you know, that's the secret to a successful life, right? Yeah. yeah. To yeah. not stay static, to evolve. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's one thing that is I I uh, I think it is becoming less and less popular among the younger generations. The idea of getting good at something, practicing something. It doesn't have to be wrestling. It could, it could be chess. It could be tennis. It could be, um, you know, fencing. Uh, it's the it's that idea of diving into something, a domain, uh, and making your experience of it rich enough that that thing you can see life through that from that mm -hmm. point on, like wrestling is life for a wrestler, of course, because right. that domain has been cultivated and has, has become such a rich field of experience that you can transfer that as a metaphor, apply that to other areas of life. Sure. Um, yeah. Uh, hopefully, hopefully the pendulum will swing and it becomes, um, you know, popular again, this kind of mastery, the idea of mastery, especially for younger people. Yep. Yeah. I, I uh, agree with you. Any, uh, well, it was such a pleasure. There are several threads that I would like to revisit with you, hopefully uh, in a future conversation, either uh, the two of us, or maybe we can get to bring together a panel of uh, the discussants. <laughs> and sure. uh, yeah, the, especially the idea of generalizability. You very briefly touched on this idea that you might figure something out about a, a, one particular person or a small group of people that might not be generalizable mm -hmm. to everybody. Is that still worth understanding and yeah. why? That's, that's mm -hmm. a, I think, a huge topic that deserves discussion. Um, anyways, uh, thank you. And any final words before we say goodbye? Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you and just get to, to get to meet you. I appreciate um, the chance to, to speak with you. Thank you, Dabu. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, we will say our private goodbye uh, once we stop recording. <laughs>